man, you asked me about my father. I wish I had been in love with my father or loved him. I wasn't, and I would not be a hypocrite. But I did love our workman. And he was my, well, he was everything. I used to say, you know, we would marry. I mean, you know, I was four and he was probably <laughs> 18. Um, will I read the little moment? Carnero, he, was, yes. he was nicknamed Carnero <laughs> for some uh, reason, uh, but that wasn't his real name. Our farmhand was nicknamed Carnero. He was roguish, lackadaisical, and disinclined to wash. He ate like a glutton. My mother had to carve the bacon or the chicken in the pantry, otherwise he would grab slices of it when her back was turned. He buttered his bread on both sides, <laughs> muttering under his breath in defiance, let's larrup it on, let's larrup it on. <laughs> he was about 18. On Saturday nights in his pelt, when he washed in the rain barrel for Sunday mass, he would sing some of his favorite songs. One was, oh, Miss Nicholas, don't be so ridiculous. I don't like it in the daytime. Night time's the right time. So, Miss Nicholas, don't be so ridiculous. <laughs> he wasn't particularly religious. Very few of the men were. They would stand at the back of the chapel and nudge one another when the priest drank the wine from the chalice, <laughs> whispering about him being a topa. <laughs> By contrast, most of the women prayed fervently, their eyes raised to the whitewashed ceiling, the better for God to hear their pitiful supplications. Carnero went to the pub each night, or rather one of the several pubs, depending on the welcome. Remarkably, for a one-horse town, there were 27 public houses, <laughs> three grocery shops, one drapery, one chemist, no cinema, and no library. And that was Carnero who did everything. He ran the place, as he kept reminding me. And there's a very poignant moment as well where he has planned to leave, to go to work with his brother in London. Yes. And your mother is bereft, and you beg him to stay. Yes, I came, he, he, was, he, he wasn't paid very much, uh, which is unfortunate, but he had reached the point where he was going, and I came home from school, and, he had locked his door, or put a, maybe not locked, no, it couldn't have been locked, but anyhow, she was barred entrance, and he was packing to leave, and, and my mother was, well, he did everything, he milked, he cut turf, he ploughed, he did, and, and oh, you know, we depended on him, and she knocked on the door, but he wouldn't admit us, and then she went away up to the yard to do something, to the boil house, she uh, cooking gruel and things for calves. And I did something terrible. I went into the room and uh, all his stuff, you know, off, bits of bicycles, bits of machinery, old shoes that they were ready to be put into a flower sack. Some were already in a flower sack. And I got down on my knees and just, if you like, manacled him, imprisoned him by putting my um, hands and arms around his ankles. And I begged of him, just not even with speech, just with that action, not to leave us. And what he did, his answer was, it was very beautiful and in another way, very upsetting. He'd had, he had one good suit and he'd had the Suit was on when I went in. He took the jacket off and he left it on his bed. And that meant he was going to come back into the kitchen and go up to the yard and do. And in the book, I say something to the effect, which actually is true. I said, I knew I had it said better than, I'm about to paraphrase it. I knew I had done something grievous to love, even though I did not know what love meant. But he forgave me, because he had great humor and great tenderness.